Welcome, everybody. I'm Gabor, and uh, it's 8 a.m. here, so please be forgiving. So uh, I got the signal, so we are good to go. Uh, I will talk about compilers, and uh, hopefully it will be something interesting. So let me introduce myself first. I'm, I used to be a PhD student and uh, waiting for my thesis defense. And we used to participate in Google Summer of Code twice as a student and mentoring other students ever since. I interned at Apple, Microsoft, and Google in various compiler teams. And currently I am working for Microsoft in the CPP static analysis team. And uh, previously I was working on the Clang static analyzer and you may know me from Herb Satter's CPPCon 2018 keynote, uh, where we were discussing uh, new static analysis that reasons about the lifetime of objects in C++. So today, uh, hopefully all of you are already interested in compilers because you are at this talk, but uh, I will talk a bit about why this topic is interesting at least uh, according to me. And hopefully I will be able to pass some myths regarding uh, the capabilities of compiler optimizations and show you some beautiful math that the compiler is using to reason about loops and how certain values are evolving over time in those loops. I will also talk about uh, some redundancy, how they are introduced into our programs and what the compiler is doing about them. A smart way of counting values that can eliminate many sources of redundancy. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you will be eager to learn more. And I will give you some resources where to look if you are interested to find out some more. Okay, so the main reason why I'm interested in compilers because they are full of uh, many beautiful algorithms and data structures. And it doesn't matter what part of computer science are you interested in, many of those, um, many of those can, oops, sorry. Many of those can actually apply in the context of compilers. And some of those applications are very elegant and uh, and that elegance is, is captivating, at least to me. While today I will talk about some algorithms that are very specific to compilers, many of the algorithms used in compilers, like scheduling, has applicability outside of compilers. And the other reason why compilers are interesting, because they are everywhere. If you think of a web browser, it has many compilers embedded in it. Uh, it, it compiles HTML and CSS to something visual. And also it compiles SVG and XML and, and so on to something else. Of course, it also has JavaScript interpreter, WebAssembly interpreter, and so on. If you think about GPU drivers, they are also full of compilers and compilers, one of the reasons why GPU manufacturers can innovate because they are free to change the specifics of the hardware and the shader programs that the programmer have written can be compiled and targeted to the new architecture. So compilers in that scenario is kind of a firewall that uh, shields the developers from the specifics of the hardware. And this makes portability possible. Also, if you think of databases, databases are full of compilers. Most databases provide the users with some query languages and those query languages are being optimized before being executed. So these optimizations are somewhat similar to optimizations in C++ compilers, but also they have very different uh, ways to measure the cost of the runtime because many database systems are optimizing for reducing the number of IO operations. So similar methods, but slightly different applications. And if you think of configuration files, many configuration formats evolved over time to be a mini language. 
in some configuration formats, you can use arithmetic, for example, if you want to describe a scene, then you might want to do arithmetic on coordinates and so on to make uh, your configuration file better express what you want. And in, in machine learning and AI, we often use frameworks with, in a high level language like Python and uh, the models that, that are developed in Python then compiled down to some highly specialized, specialized hardware that can execute those models very efficiently. So we have compilers everywhere. Even we have compilers for routers and we have very different uh, constraints there. Because uh, in case of networking, when a package is corrupted, you can resend that package. So if you can do a transformation that will corrupt the package every once in a while, but increases the throughput overall, that is a transformation that you might want to do in a network setting. But that is something that you definitely don't want to do in a C++ compiler because you don't want to render the code uh, semantically to something very different. But I will talk more on that a bit later. Also, it is a good, it might be a good exercise to sometimes just point at a program. It can be any program, like a program in an office suite or a mail client or so on, and just think about how many compilers are embedded in those software, even if those compilers are very tiny ones. For example, for example, in browsers, there is a really tiny one that is parsing URLs and, and so on. Okay, and the other reason why it is interesting to study compilers, because you have a lot, a lot of opportunities to improve the life of people, even if by a little bit. So this is basically a big multiplier effect. If you improve a compiler a bit, you can improve all of the software that is compiled with those compilers. So you have the chance to improve the life of some developers. And the users of those programs can also benefit from those improvements. So this is uh, really great. If you make a new optimization, even if it only speeds up the programs by the tiny fraction, multiplied by the number of users who benefit from these optimizations can account to an enormous savings in electricity and so on. Or if you uh, develop a new warning that can find a few new bugs, then that can also improve the life of many people, even if by a little bit. But more, if you improve a compiler that is a compiler of a low level language like C++, the impact can be even more far reaching. For example, if you improve a compiler, a C++ compiler, that compiler can be used to compile like the Java VM, for example. So all of the Java applications can benefit from the improvements you made in a C++ compiler. Okay, let's start with a small code example. And let's talk about loop strength reduction. Here, we have a loop that has a multiplication in its body. And if we look at the assembly that was generated by the compiler, we don't see any multiplication. In fact, we see an addition. So what the compiler did, the compiler replaced i times five with an increment, incrementing i by five in every iteration. So we will get the same values, but we will use an addition instead of a multiplication. So we replaced a relatively costly operation with a cheaper one. So as a result, while we execute this instruction the same number of times as before the transformation, but we execute a cheaper operation. So this is how we can have a speed up that is a constant factor. So the question is, can we do better than constant factor uh, speed ups using compiler optimization? This is one of the questions I will try to answer in this first segment of the talk, but 
let me let me ask Matt to uh, describe uh, the topic that I will talk about in a few minutes. But let's have a look at what Clang does again. Oh, that's interesting. There's no loop. There's a test in that blue region, and that test is just saying if it's less than or equal to zero, then the answer's zero. And then that yellow block, which apparently corresponds to sum plus equals i, I don't know how the compiler came to that conclusion, but is just a move, a funny LEA and a multiply. What's going on there? Well, as most of you probably know, there is a closed form solution to summation. Clang has worked out again what I'm doing, and it's replaced a code with a closed form solution. Yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome, right? Even more interestingly, it hasn't actually used the thing that I always use, the x, x plus one over two. It has, in fact, replaced it with x plus x minus one over two. They're equivalent. The reason being is that what happens if we passed in int max, right? It would have worked, the loop version would have worked for int max, but it wouldn't have worked if we had to do x, x plus one, we would have overflowed, it would have all gone horribly wrong. I mean, how you'd get int max command line arguments onto a, a, a function is another problem, but you know, essentially they've de dealt with the overflow case as well, and, and it turns out you can tinker with that code quite a bit, and it will like move things around and ultimately just give you a closed form solution every time. Just think about what that's doing. It's taken an order n piece of code I wrote and turned it into a linear, sorry, a constant time operation. Okay, so what happened? The compiler took a loop that was doing a linear number of operations and replaced it with a closed form that is doing constant number of operations. And let's play a bit with the code example that Matt showed us four years ago. So here, this code example is very similar what Matt showed us. And as you can see, there is no loop here. The easiest way to tell why there is no loop here, because if you loop, at, if you look at the labels and you look at the jumps, all of the jumps are going forward. We don't have a back edge. We never jump backwards. And if we don't jump backwards, we cannot have a loop because we cannot have the same piece of code executed multiple times. So let's play a bit with this code snippet. I will increase the increment. And as you can see, the generated code changed slightly, but we still don't have a loop. Let's make this operation in the summation a bit more complex. Like let's multiply it by 42. And again, a couple of small changes in the generated code, but we still don't have a loop. Okay, let's have a something quadratic here. Now, a couple, couple, yeah, quite a bit of code is generated here, but we don't have any back edges, so we still don't have a loop. Okay, let's try to rewrite this. So let's use a while loop instead of a for loop. Okay, so again, I rewrote this using a while loop and we still don't see any loops in the generated assembly. So basically we have constant number of operations. I see the question, could I explain again how constant time is achieved against linear timing? So in case the question is, how does this optimization work? This is something that I will talk about later. In case this refers to why is it constant number of operations? Because uh, the number of assembly instructions I'm executing doesn't depend on the input. So it doesn't matter how big the argument of this function f is, I will always only execute the number of instructions that are inside this generated function body because I only go forward and never go backward. So this is why it is a linear time, uh, execution time function. 
So as you can see, I can do quite a bit of uh, modifications to this loop and the compiler still figures out a closed form for this loop. It is quite robust. And at this point, one might wonder, what can I do to this loop to trick the compiler, to make the compiler really, really generate a loop instead of optimizing this away? And there is one easy way to do that. I can make the induction variable float. And in this case, you will see that they, I have a la label in the middle of the generated code, and I have a jump instruction that jumps backwards. So now I have a loop in the generated code. And in fact, if the compiler were to do the same kind of optimization that it did with the integer induction variable, it would not be correct. So in this case, the reason why the compiler doesn't optimize the loop away because it would not give the same answer. And this has to do uh, something with how the floating point arithmetic works and how is it totally different from integer arithmetic. I, I won't go into the details, but uh, probably some of you already have a feel for it. Why, why is this the case? So for the next part of this talk, let's onboard the compiler's lead. And let's see what's inside. And spoiler alert, it's math. But don't be afraid of it. It's very simple math. It's very easy to understand. And uh, it has, it has unreasonable, unreasonable effectiveness how it carries out certain tasks. So the theory I will talk about today called chains of recurrences. And let's, ta let's talk about the first principles. Let's talk about recur recursive functions. So what those recursive functions are. Recursive functions are functions that are calculating a value based on the previous value of the same function. So let's look at an example. Probably most of you know the factorial function. The factorial function is defined this way. So we have a base case because the value of the factorial function is one for, so the, so the factorial of zero is one, and we have a recursive case because um, we know what the, we, we know how to compute the next factorial. We multiply the previous factorial by N. So this is how uh, uh, we can describe recursive function, a function that refers back to its previous value. But uh, the notation uh, we are using here, the notation we are using in math is very verbose. And in order to talk about these functions, a subset of these recursive functions, I will show you an alternative notation that I will use throughout the rest of the talk. But this will describe the same uh, function, but it will look uh, slightly more terse. So let's look at an example. If we look at this factorial function, we can represent this as a tuple. And this is the same because we have a base case and we have an operation. And that operation is used to combine the previous value with somehow with another value, the n, to get the new value of the recursive function. And some of you might say that this is a fault and in fact, it is a fault in some sense. So basically we can use this notation to represent a subset of the recursive functions. And uh, this notation will help to guide us how to build up an algebra that we can use to reason about code. At this point, it might not be obvious why why recursive functions are so useful for loops. So let's look at a small example. Here we have a very simple summation and uh, we have an initial value. And in each iteration, we increase this value by an increment. So we can describe, we can, we can have a function that tells us the value of V in iteration I and this function we can describe this function recursively using the terse notation I showed you earlier. So we have the initial value of initial, 
we have the plus operation to combine the values and we have the increment to increase the values. And to see how this function can describe the evolution of the value V over time, let's look at a couple of iterations. So in the before the first iteration, we have the value initial. After the first iteration, we have the value initial plus increment, then initial plus two times increment, initial plus three times increment, and so on. So this might be obvious, and this might not be that interesting so far, but bear with me, it, it is getting beautiful soon. So let's look at a slightly more complicated example. Here, we want to reason about the variable, the value i times i. So it's a quadratic expression. Let's see how the method how the method of using recursive functions can help us with this one. So basically we want to have a recursive function that tells us the value i times of i times i in iteration n. It is relatively easy to see that we have the value zero before the first iteration. And uh, to get a feel for it, how this value evolves, let's look at a couple of iterations again. And if we look at the values from these iterations, we can see each of the values are slightly bigger than the previous one. And using a summation, a recursive function with a summation worked out so far. So let's try that. Okay, so now the question is, what should we use as an increment? And here I will use the advice I was given by Tony in the keynote yesterday. I hope some of you saw this talk. It was, it was awesome. So basically, if we don't know what to put as an increment, just let's invent a function, wishful thinking. I wish if a function g existed that described how should this increment behave? What should be the increment in each of the iterations? And then we try to implement this function. We try to come up a way, how can we describe these increments? And maybe some of you already see that. If you look at the increments, each of the value is a bit bigger than the previous one. We have exactly the odd numbers as increments. So if you want to describe the value, the evolution of the values one, three, five, seven over time, it is relatively easy because we can use a function that has one as an initial value and has two as the increment. And then we can plug this function back into the original. And to make the notation a bit more terse, we can remove some of the braces. So this is a very terse representation of how the value i times i, i evolves over time. And uh, to get to this, uh, to get to this point, we had to have a bit of creativity, but this is something that we will take care of in a second. But first, let's talk about algebras. What is an algebra? It is coming from the Arabic language, and I won't try to pronounce this because I don't want to butcher it, but uh, this used to mean that it is the reunion of broken parts. A bit more scientific description would be the study of symbols and the rules to manipulate those symbols. But for all intents and purposes, Algebras are like Lego pieces. And while some people say that all analogies are wrong, but some are useful, so let's look at how this analogy might be useful. So let's try to build an algebra of Lego pieces to help us understand how these algebras work and how can we derive one from recursive functions that will help us to reason about the evolution of these values over time. Okay, so one property of algebras that they have to be closed. For example, if I have two Lego pieces, I can combine them, combine them in some ways to get a new Lego piece. 
but I cannot combine two Lego pieces and uh, get a car out of it or combine two Lego pieces and get a hamster out of it or so on. So we have some restrictions. We combine two parts and get something that is still part of our algebra. And we also have certain rules. For example, if we have three Lego pieces, we can stack them on top of each other and we can get a shape like this. But it doesn't matter how do you try to stack those Lego pieces, we cannot ever get a shape like this second one. So we cannot do anything with those pieces. And these operations that we can do with those pieces have some identities. For example, it doesn't matter if I stack blue on top of the red first and this new Lego piece on top of the yellow, or I first stack the red on top of the yellow and get blue and stack it on the top of this piece I got earlier. So it doesn't matter what order do I carry these operations out, I get the same results. So this is the, this is the beauty of algebras and let's see how we can build an algebra using recursive functions. So if we have a simple recursive function, like those that I talked about earlier, I might want to add a constant value to it. So for example, if I have a recursive function that starts from one and has the increment of two, and I add the constant five to this uh, recursive function, I will get a recursive function that has the initial value of six, and has the same increment. So basically, if I add a constant to a recursive function, I will only need to change the initial value. And now I will talk about the rest of the operations that we might want to do with recursive functions. And uh, while this might be a bit dry, it will be, it will be probably um, more impressive once you will see what else can we do with these identities in a bit? So if we are multiplying a constant with a recursive function, we need to multiply both the initial value and the increment. If we are adding two recursive functions, we have to add both the initial values and the increment. I'm not showing you why these identities are true, but um, if you want to convince yourself, you can always plug in some concrete numbers, some examples, and see how they work out. Or if you, if you are more into math, you can try to prove this formally. Also, I have the orange plus that is part of the recursive function and the regular plus that is just the plus operation that we know. Okay, and if we want to multiply two recursive functions, that's a bit more involved, and I won't go into the details why is this the case, but this is also an identity that we will use a lot in the rest of the talk. And let me show you something. So if we have a constant value, this constant value is in fact a recursive function because a, it, it is a recursive function where the initial value is this constant value, and the increment is zero. So it is never changing across the iterations. What this means, we can create recursive functions from constants. We can pad those constants with zero increments, or we can leave those zero increments out. And why this is great? This is great because we no longer need the first two rules because now we are only dealing with recursive functions. We don't need to care about constants because we can lift constants into the realm of recursive functions. So now we have less rules to care about. And uh, what I want to emphasize, these identities are not something that you need to learn. These identities are merely something that you might want to understand once and you never even need to remember them again. These are more, that, more like implementation guides, how to carry out certain optimizations. And I will show you in a bit how you can think of these identities as implementation guides. Okay, so let's re revisit the same example we had before. We want to reason about the value of i times i. 
So uh, probably it is easy to see how the value i evolves over time because it starts out zero and it is incremented by one in each of the iterations. So we can relatively easily uh, use this notation to describe how this value evolves over time. And now the question is, can we derive the value i times i from the value i over time? And of course we can, we just use the identity that I showed you earlier. So we have the same recursive function twice and we multiply them together. And using the same identity I showed you earlier, all we need to do to plug in all the values in the place in, in the variables and do the calculations, and we get the same result that I showed you earlier. So why is this important? This is important because we only did manual steps at this point. We had the identities that I showed you earlier, and we applied these identities repeatedly, and we got to the conclusion. So we did not need any creativity. We just repeated mechanical steps. And the reason why is this interesting? Because at the time, creativity is out of the way and you only have mechanical steps to do, to carry out an operation. That means that this is something that you can implement. So you can take a compiler, you can code up these identities, the repeated use of these identities, and now the compiler can do the algebra. The compiler will know how to multiply two recursive functions together. And uh, let's see why is this really powerful. So now I have a slightly more complicated example, and now I will not work out uh, these examples to that detail, but feel free to do it yourself to get a feel for the powerfulness or effectiveness of this method. So we already know what the how the value i and i squared evolves over time. And uh, let's see how we can, let's see what values can be derived. So basically using the same methods I showed you earlier, we can derive two times i, we can derive the value of i plus one, we can derive the value of i plus, I plus one squared. And putting these together, we can build up bigger and bigger expressions. So basically, once we calculate how the values of these sub-expressions evolves over time, combining them together repeatedly, like Lego pieces, we can get bigger Lego pieces. We can get the, how the value of certain expressions, bigger expressions evolves over time. And uh, after carrying out all these operations, what we can came up with, basically we can see that the value of this expression is one, is the constant function one. So we can replace the function we have above, or sorry, the loop that we have above with the loop that we have below. So instead of doing all those calculations in the top loop, we can just store the constant one into this array. So this might not be so surprising to some of you who already know about this identity in math, so i plus one squared is i squared plus two times i plus one. So basically I reformulated this identity, but the reason why is this very uh, interesting? Because um, if I want to be tricky and I want to trick the compiler into not optimizing this piece of code, if I want to make an expression algebraically more complicated, now the compiler can use simple identities repeatedly, use some mechanical steps, and by repeated application of these mechanical steps, the compiler can derive the simplest algebraic expression to carry out this operation. So using these simple rules I showed you earlier, the compiler can simplify complex algebraic expressions like this one and figure out all it needs to do is to store a constant, which is much more efficient than doing all the operations above. So basically these simple rules, all we did like talk about recursive functions, additions, multiplications, and, and so on. 
with, with all these different, uh, all these uh, relatively simple rules, we could teach the compiler how to how to optimize algebraically. Okay, so let's look at some other examples why these chains of recurrences are important. Oh, sorry, I didn't talk about why we call them chains of recurrences. We call them chains of recurrences because we have recursive functions where the increments are other recursive functions. So basically we are chaining recursive functions together. So this is where the name is coming from. Okay, so the one of the reasons why we like these chains of recurrences so much, because they can also help us derive closed forms. So if we have a plus b, a recursive function like this that is represented by this tuple, it has the initial value a, then the value a plus b, a plus two times b, and so on. So basically, this is an arithmetic series with a difference of b, and we have, if we have this function as the increment of other function, because this is an arithmetic series, we know a close formula to the sum of the first n elements of the arithmetic series. And because we know that closed formula, we can replace a loop with a closed formula. And of course, this is not the only, this is not the only formula. So this is not the only series that we know the closed, closed formula to, but this is probably one of the most well-known one. And this can give you a feel why the compiler can figure out the closed form for uh, those loops. And if we talk about loop strength reduction, this is the very similar code snippet I showed you earlier. Let's see what the chains of recurrences will do to this one. So if we want to reason about the value of five times i, we get the tuple zero plus five. So we get a description that e should be incremented by five each in each iteration. So we get the strength reduced version of the loop for free if we do the chains of recurrences correctly. And uh, if we look at the, yeah, this is the rewritten version of the loop. And if we look at a slightly more complicated example, here we have initially four additions and two multiplications in this expression. And uh, if we use the same mechanical transformations I showed you earlier, we can get to a relatively compact representation of how the value of that expression evolves over time. And we can use this representation to rewrite the loop using only two additions. So this is also a very significant, uh, it has very significant strength to uh, and ex expressivity and it can reduce the number of operations. But as, as I showed you earlier, in some cases, it can also eliminate loops and get us some asymptotic speed up. And if we look, about, look at the same code snippet showed by Matt Goldbolt, we can also see that it is relatively easy to describe the value of result using a recurrence the way I showed you earlier. So this is why Clang can eliminate the loop. And now I would like to show you how this works in action. So let me share another screen. Hopefully you can see my terminal now. Um, so I wanted to show you how Clang reasons about this code snippet. So as you can see, this is the same code snippet I showed you earlier. And I don't want to remember all the commands, so I have a small script. And let's see what is happening. So initially, I will compile the source file with optimizations on, but I will disable the LLVM passes because I want to run these passes in a specific way. 
and then with the LLVM IR. I do run some passes that are kind of a prerequisite for the analysis, the scalar evolution analysis that implements these chains of recurrences in LLVM. And then I will use the opt tool to run the scalar evolution analysis. And if you look at the output from this analysis, you can see that it, Clang is actually coming to the same conclusion that I showed you earlier. And Clang is using the same notation I showed you earlier. So basically, we can represent these recursive functions, these chains of recursive functions and as tuple, tuples. And you can see that this is exactly what Clang is doing. And this is exactly the kind of reasoning that is carried out by Clang, or more specifically, LLVM in this case. And I wanted to show you another trick. Maybe you heard about optimization remarks, maybe not. But basically, you can get some information out of the compiler to see what kind of optimizations were done. Not, so this is a work in progress feature, so you won't get every bit of information. And this is more uh, targeted to compiler developers, but sometimes it can be insightful to run these uh, optimization remarks. And uh, now I have a remark that this loop is deleted. So this is another way to verify that the compiler was able to remove a loop from my program. And I just wanted to show you one more example. Here I have a function that mainly works with even numbers and subtracts two from the even numbers and increases a count. And it returns how many times could I subtract two before reaching zero. So this is kind of a way to divide by two unless I got it wrong, of course, which is possible. And let's see what will happen if I do the same to this file. I won't go into the details, but as you can see, Clang was able to remove the loop in this function as well. So here we also got replaced a linear operation with a constant time operation. So as you can see, these optimizations are quite powerful and they are not only optimizing very obvious loops, but they can also optimize loops that are less obvious why those should be considered uh, for, for these kind of simplif simplifications. Okay, let me go back to the slides. In case you want to learn more about uh, chains of recurrences, I recommend you to check out this Euro LLVM talk. And as far as I uh, remember, GCC also has an implementation of uh, chains of recurrences. There are many academic papers on this topic. And the LLVM scalar evolu evo evolution, sorry, this is also uh, can be a good source to look into how this can work in practice. And in fact, uh, as I showed you earlier, these are just a couple of simple identities. So it is not that hard to implement them, at least not that hard to implement some parts of, of this. Because of course, we did not talk about a large class of recursive functions. We only talked about small class of recursive functions. Not all of the recursive functions have these shapes I described, but these recursive functions prove to be the most useful ones when it comes to compiler optimizations. Okay, so let's quickly recap the chains of uh, recurrences. So this is a great model to loop, to model how some variables evolve over time in loop iterations and a simple algebra of recursive functions that has tremendous power. And it can do algebraic simplifications, it can optimize away linear uh, code into constant uh, runtime code. It can also give you certain optimizations for free, like loop strength reduction. And this is something that we like a lot when it comes to compilers, when we implement one algorithm and it carries out multiple tasks. That's, that's great. And actually it can do 
a lot more because uh, I did not talk about many of the use cases of this analysis. For example, if you have a if you have a scalar evolution where the initial value is one and the increment is two, then you know that every value of this uh, expression will be odd. So if you have a branch where you check for the last bit of this value, you know that it will be always true. So basically you can do that code elimination and constant folding and all those kind of stuff using the results from this analysis. And you can also derive closed forms from this analysis. Yeah, and many more. So the next topic I would like to talk about is value numbering, how we eliminate uh, some forms of redundancy. But before going into value numbering, I will look at some of the questions and try to answer some of those. Okay, so it looks like compilers use a lot of algebraic properties of operations. They seem very useful. How can we expose them to the programmers? So I, I'm not sure I understand the question, but indeed the compilers rely on a lot of the algebraic properties of certain operations. And uh, I, I guess one of the question could be if the, if the author of a code writes an overloaded operation, like an overloaded class or an overloaded uh, multiplication, then the compiler can no longer be sure whether those algebraic properties hold. So the compiler cannot know if your overloaded plus operation is, is commutative, whether is it associative and so on, because you are free to write whatever code you want into the body of that uh, operation. So if the question is how can the how can the programmer communicate to the compiler while I implemented this operation, it does have these algebraic properties. Unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that, and I would love to have an answer for that. Probably it is it should be possible to implement um, certain annotations, but those annotations are would be very dangerous because uh, if you ever got it wrong, the compiler would uh, change the behavior, the observable behavior of your code. So basically, um, basically, even if you got it right the first time, maybe someone later on would slightly change your operation, your plus operation, for example. Someone might add logging operations to it or something like that. And after that change, uh, those properties might no longer be true. So each time you change the implementation of a function, you will need to reevaluate all the properties. And I believe the dangers of this um, kind of annotations is one of the main reasons why this is not exposed to the programmers at this point. But uh, I believe if someone had a good proposal, uh, the committee would probably be open to discuss a solution for this problem. Yeah, so there was this uh, question of uh, storing a constant is not equivalent if the actual operations overflow. That's a really good point. And this is something that I will talk about a bit later. So actually optimizations don't need to preserve the semantics of the program. Optimizations need to refine the semantics of the program. If there is an overflow in the code that is undefined behavior, and in that case, the compiler is free to do whatever it wants to do. And in this case, the compiler, the compiler might want to just store the same constant that it would store when there is no overflow. Of course, it, is, it would be very different if, um, if we used unsigned integer types instead of signed integer types, because in case of unsigned integer types, the overflow has a well-defined semantics. So the compiler might not be able to do the same set of optimizations. And I think this is a great case for using signed integer types when you are doing calculations because the compiler can do more, in general, the compiler can do more optimizations when it comes to signed integer types. Okay, the question is, is there a limit to the nesting here? Is, is the particular limit the same as the theoretical limit? 
I'm thinking of the lack of closed forms form solution for quintic polynomials. Is that the right thought? So uh, fortunately, most of the loops that um, compilers try to optimize are not deeply nested, but chains of recurrences can work with nested loops. For example, if you have an innermost loop and you have an outermost loop, the induction variable of the outermost loop is loop invariant in the innermost loop. But if you are thinking of nesting in terms of recurrence relations and not in terms of loops, I guess this is what you alluded to. Uh, yes, we definitely don't have a closed form for every... So we can express recursive functions that we don't have a closed form for, but unfortunately I don't have a good... Um, so on top of my head, I don't know where these limitations are. So I, I cannot really give you an answer. Uh, I, I would refer to some of the academic papers in this uh, in this topic to find out what the what the practical and what the theoretical limits are. Uh, for for practical purposes, how most of the compiler developers work, they look at real world examples, real world uh, code snippets that they want to make faster, and they use they are looking for tools that can help on those. Um, on those cases. And that uh, this is this is a wonderful tool to do that. And fortunately, most of the real world code uh, will not really exercise the limits of this method. At least most that I looked at. Uh, do any other compilers support loss form optimization or does it only work in Clang? That's a really good question. Uh, I, I didn't look into other compilers too deeply, but I think it should be relatively easy to implement in other compilers as well, because other compilers are already doing very similar reasoning. I think one of the reasons why some of the compilers might not do it yet, in case they don't do it, because it is not easy to see when this transformation is correct. It, uh, as some of the earlier uh, questions pointed out, there are some non-trivial cases when it comes to overflow with unsigned types and so on. So basically, in order to implement these transformations, first we need to uh, we need to uh, check when this transformation preserved the semantics in all of the corner cases, like overflow cases. So I, I believe. In this particular case of, of like implementing these closed form uh, optimizations, this is one of the biggest obstacles that uh, can prevent uh, implementers from uh, implementing these optimizations. Okay, thank you for all of the questions. I, I think these were these these were really really great questions. I, I'm very excited uh, for for them. So let's continue with value numbering. So value numbering uh, can help with certain sources of redundancy. And first I would like to talk about uh, what kind of redundancies am I talking about? For example, here we are calculating the same expression twice, A times B. And uh, this calculation could be hoisted and it could be done only once by storing the result of this value into a temporary variable and using this variable instead of redoing the computation. So, but my point will be by the end of this talk, I'm giving it away at the beginning just to not to give the wrong message. You don't need to do, often if, if, you, are, if you are dealing with, with primitive types, you don't need to do this kind of common sub-expression elimination yourself, you can trust the compiler to do it for you. But most of the redundancy is not coming from something that the comp compiler author wrote. Uh, sorry, most of the redundancy is not coming from the programmer. Most of the redundancy is coming from the compiler authors. Because if you think of an operation, for example, addressing a matrix, it, while we are lowering this code, to memory accesses, we are doing some kind of computation to compute 
what kind of memory address should we uh, load to or load from or store to and, and so on. And when we are doing these computations, we often repeat a sub-expression many, many times. So compiler passes can introduce quite a bit of redundancy. And uh, also sometimes we can see that code. For example, we store a value to a memory location and we never read that value. In that case, it was redundant to store that value and, and we could remove that store. Or in other cases, we might see a value passed around a lot and we could eliminate all of those copies. So these are some of the equivalent versions of the code I showed you earlier. And let's talk a bit about how compilers work in general. And again, I would like to refer back to Tony's keynote from yesterday, because what you see here is the compiler's version of KISS, keep your stuff separate. So basically, instead of the compiler trying to do every smartness at once, it does it have separate passes and every pass tries to do only one thing and it tries to do it well. So the lowering part of the compiler that generates a lower representation of your source code might emit something that most developers would consider garbage because it's unoptimal, it contains a lot of redundancy, but it relies on later passes to clean that complexity to, to clean that redundancy up. And this is how compilers handle redundancy. Sorry, this is how compilers uh, handle complexity. And uh, sometimes you might even see compiler passes that end up making the code look more complicated and less optimal, at least temporarily, because while those transformations can make the code less optimal in the short run, those transformations can open up new optimization possibilities down the line in later passes. So basically, one pass alone might be relatively dumb. And later, and when we combine those passes together, this is where the strength of the compiler will become apparent. So when we are thinking about optimizations, we are not only thinking about individual passes, but we also think about how these passes are playing along and what is the effect of compiling these pass passes, how should we order these passes, how many times should we run these passes, and so on. And uh, I would like to show some of the examples uh, about value numbering today in Brill, the big red intermediate language. This is a compiler compiler IR that, that is very similar to LLVM and used in some compiler courses. And I, I would like to give a shout out to all of the authors of these tools because I think they are awesome. And let me show you why uh, I'm choosing to Brill to show you some of the optimization algorithms. I will try to see, switch to another screen. Yep. So this is from the GitHub repository of Brill. And this is a documentation about the core language. And as you can see in Brill, we have two types, integers and bools. We have four arithmetic operations. We have five comparison operations, three logical operations, and the bit of control flow like unconditional jumps, conditional jumps, function call, return from a function, and some other operations. So this is how many operations you need to deal with when you are prototyping a pass in Brill. This is just a handful of them. On the other hand, if you look at the LLVM, this is just the table of content for the LLVM language reference, the IR language reference. So it is, a, it is enormous and there is a lot that you need to consider when you are writing an LLVM pass and this can be daunting at, at the beginning. So basically what I would like you to do, if you are interested in trying out some compiler passes, you don't need to jump to LLVM right, right away. You can pick something simpler like Brill 
and try to prototype your ideas there. And this can give you a lot of insight without considering all of the complexity of the rest of the world. So I believe this is the best way to learn about compilers, to look at simple examples first. Okay, so let's go back to the talk. And actually, let me show you a teaser what Brill does. Okay, so I will show you a couple examples uh, why Brill is great. So this is a piece of Brill code. So it's a textual representation of this intermediate representation. And here you can see I'm loading two constants and adding those constants together and printing the results. So it's a very simple program. So what I can do with it, I can print the JSON representation of this program. So JSON is a very versatile format and uh, I can, so this is basically the same uh, information that I showed you earlier, but this is in a format that, uh, that is much easier to process. And I will work with uh, this JSON format going forward. And we also have an interpreter. So I can run, I can run this code and get free the value I printed. So it's one plus two and I printed it's free. Okay, and let's see why is this great. So the reason why is this great? Because now you can write passes relatively easily. So for example, this is a very simple pass written in Python. All it does, it loads some JSON from the standard input. It loops through the functions and it loops through the instructions in the functions. And if it sees an addition operation, it will replace that addition operation with a subtraction. So basically, this is a pass that will change the semantic of the code, but we can easily, uh, we can easily combat, make our own pipeline in the shell. So I can just, I can just run my pass and print the result. And as you can see, now I see a subtraction instead of an addition. And I can also feed it to the interpreter to see that the result indeed changed. It's no longer three, but it's minus one because I have one minus two. And okay, I can also play easily, experiment easily with this uh, pipeline. For example, I can rerun the same pass several times and see that I still get the same result. So I have an idempotent pass. It doesn't matter how many times I run this pass, it, the subsequent runs of this pass will not change the code. So I can easily experiment with all these properties of the passes I have written. So let's recap. Brill is great because you don't need to compile anything. You can use any language you want, for example, Python, and you can experiment really quickly with a language that is really small and you can build your own pipeline without any hard coding or recompiling and you can uh, see what the results are. You can both run your code, render, render your code as text or look into the JSON representation. And it is re really trivial because there is not, not an API to think about. There is, a, there is a small JSON schema, but it is very easy to memorize that. And you no longer need to deal with any API. You can use any language of your choice 
to write small compiler passes and experiment with the results. And uh, yeah, it has great tooling support. Okay, so before I go into value numbering, let me talk about some of the terminology we use in optimizations. So here we have a function on the left-hand side, and we have the control flow graph for this function on the right-hand side. Co uh, the control flow graph is a graph where each node is a basic block. A basic block is a sequence of instructions that are always executed in that order. So there is no jump in between those instructions. And there is there can be only a jump at the end of the basic block. And uh, when we talk about optimizations, uh, we talk about local optimizations when we are uh, considering one basic block at the time. So local optimizations don't need to think about control flow. We might have super local optimizations that are considering a region of code. This can be a loop or an extended basic block, which is a tree of basic block for tree of basic blocks for all intents and purposes. And when we talk about global optimizations, global optimizations means that we are optimizing the whole function, the whole control flow graph. So it's still, the, the optimization is still within the function. The reason why we are calling it global because the terminology is coming from earlier, way earlier than uh, loading the whole translation unit into the memory at time looked infeasible. So loading one function into the memory was all you get. So if you can, if you get to optimize the whole function at once, it was pretty much global. You couldn't go like to a bigger scope. But of course, today we have interprocedural optimizations that can also optimize across the function call boundaries. And the value numbering algorithm I will talk about have many variants. And today I will talk about the simplest variant that is called local value numbering. And one of the key points of this local value numbering or value numbering in general, it reasons about values, not variables. So a variable might have multiple values over time and we will try to number these values in a, in a smart way. And this will help us uncover that code or eliminate common sub-expression, copy, pro copy propagation, and much more. So this is, this is one of the reasons why we like these optimizations because, because you, can, you can hit multiple birds with the same stone or something like that. So you can use the implement something once and get many, many good results out of it. So I want to show you uh, an animation. Instead of describing the algorithm, I would like to show you an example how this algorithm works, because it is not that important to know the specifics. The important part is to, to get an intuition what this algorithm does. It is only important to know the specifics when you are actually implementing this algorithm. Okay. So this is a piece of code and we start with the first, uh, we start with the first value that is a constant and we haven't seen this value yet. So we give this value a number. And uh, I will also indicate the value number in the source code. And we store this value to this memory location. So we have a canonical home to this value and we have an environment that maps these uh, values that, that is a mapping between the memory region, memory and these values. Okay, we see a load from a variable. We haven't seen this. So you give it a new number and we see a store. So we update the environment and we also update the canonical home to the, oh, sorry, we don't update the canonical home, but we see another yeah, I, I will talk about this a bit later. So there, uh, because this is a C++ conference, I wanted to show you C++ code. 
but uh, basically basically this this code this algorithm is usually carried out on an intermediate representation and that intermediate representation have some rules for example it's often you cannot carry out an operation like a constant plus uh, value stored at a memory uh, stored at a location but first you need to store the constant into a location and then you can carry out an operation between those two locations. So, the, so for this reason, we only need a canonical home for the constants, but not for the other memory locations. Okay, so let's continue. So the constant three has the value number two, and we store it to X. So this is a constant, so this we have canonical home, and we update the mapping. And now we see a value that is already stored in our map. So we can assign the same value to Y and update the environment. And we can do the same again. So since Y is already in our environment, we can use it to look up the value. And we can also transform the code to store the constant that is at that location and update the environment. Now we see an addition, and uh, in the one of the operands is a ver variable v, so we can rewrite it with the values that we have in the map that has the value number one. And when we look at b, b has the value number two, so we can also rewrite this to use the value that, is, that corresponds to the number two, and it has the canonical home of X. And we can store a new value number. So now we store the value number one plus the value number two. And this is a new value we haven't seen before. So we will assign the value number three for this value. And we store this value to the location S. Okay, and then we, when we look at the next uh, addition, we can see that the B has the value that was number two, and A has the value that was numbered one. And now there is an interesting bit. So I already have the value uh, one plus two, and here I have two plus one. And since addition of integers is commutative, I can replace I can replace this addition this addition with the canonical home for this value s so basically this is where the common sub expression elimination happened and after this I ran out of space so I didn't continue the algorithm but hopefully you can get a feel what is happening here how constant propagation happened in the middle and uh, also, if it is not a constant in that case, I can propagate the copies and how common sub-expression elimination happened here. So value numbering is an algorithm where we assign a new value for something that we didn't see before. And we look up a value that we, we, have, we have seen before uh, when, when there is something guaranteed to have the same value. So it is based on hash tables. And the way we are assigning numbers to these values, when two expressions have the same value number, it means that they are guaranteed to have the same value at runtime. And we can use this to do some very simple transformations. And the later that code elimination pass can come and uh, clean up the code because this value numbering itself will not remove much code, but it will open up uh, optimization opportunities for a later that code elimination pass. Okay, so as you saw, value numbering is also using algebraic identities because it used the commutativity of addition to, to be able to uh, do the common sub-expression elimination in this case. So it, it is used, it, it, it had this uh, had this identity built in that A plus B is the same as B plus A. 
And also we had a we need to have a later that code elimination pass to to actually clean the code up. And this optimization can also do constant folding because if I see an addition where both of the operands are constant, compile time known values, instead of storing this value number into the environment or the maps that we have, what we can do instead, we can just do the operation and store the, the constant that we get from the operation. But one of the problems with this approach is that we cannot preserve the semantics of the code. For example, let's imagine that you have a division and uh, the, you have zero, you want to divide by zero if you do the constant propagation. Of course, if you do that, the compiler will stop working and you don't want to do that. So, but you are forced to do something. And this is why it is so important to think about optimizations in terms of refinement rather than something that uh, that helps that preserves the semantics of the code. So we don't want to preserve the semantics of the code in all cases. And there are many examples when the semantics is, is not preserved in case of an undefined behavior uh, is, is present at CPP reference. And also there are uh, that there is a great talk by John Regger and, and, and some others that are listed in this talk uh, that I would recommend if you want to learn more about undefined behavior. And what I wanted to show you, uh, the value numbering algorithm I showed you earlier. Uh, so this is, this is a code in Brill. This is a code in Brill that has constants, many constants, has copies, has some multiplications and, and some print at the end. So basically it, it is doing a lot, but everything it does is known at compile time, almost everything. And if I run this, if I run the local value numbering algorithm on this code and run the that code elimination algorithm after that, I will get I will get to a very small code snippet that will only calculate what is absolutely necessary. So basically, this value numbering algorithm can be really, really powerful, and it can do many of the constant folding that we are usually interested to see. So even this works even without constexpr. You don't need constexpr support to carry out many op operations at compile time, you only need a nice algorithm like value numbering. And what I wanted to show you and emphasize, you don't need to be a rockstar programmer to implement these algorithms. If uh, you look at my implementation of the local value numbering, it is le less than a couple hundreds of lines of code. So it's, it's actually, 148 lines. And actually what it is doing, it is also doing the constant propagation part. So the biggest part of that code is dealing with the evaluating the results of the operations. For example, if I have a constant on left-hand side and right-hand side, and this operation is a plus, let's do, the, let's do the addition. If I have a constant on the left and the right, and this is a multiplication, let's do the multiplication and so on. So this, kind of a small interpreter that is embedded in local value numbering, it takes up most of the space in my case. And if we, and then this was implemented in a couple of hours because Brill is, is such, a, such a small language, you don't need to implement this for many constructs. And if you look at my dead code elimination example, it's less than 50 lines of code. And actually this, this uh, file has two variants of the dead code elimination algorithm. So it, it doesn't even need to be that big. So less than 200 lines of code, and you can have a kind of a compiler for yourself that does dead code elimination, that does common sub-expression elimination, constant folding, and, and all that. And so, so you don't need to write too much code and you don't need to learn too much theory or, or you don't need to have a PhD in compilers to get started and implement some algorithms. 
that are really, really powerful and can do many, many optimizations. So if you want to learn more, uh, I recommend the Engineering a Compiler book and the Cornell. So on Cornell, there is, there is a graduate level compilers course and they are the author of the Brill um, intermediate representation that I advocated in this talk. And if you want to learn more about value numbering, I recommend you to look at lessons three and it will have everything and it is much more comprehensive uh, than my talk. And it and the lecture is really great. It, it is a really entertaining uh, to, to watch those lectures. And LVM has a global value numbering pass. And uh, so that can reason across basic blocks to some degree. So if you want to learn even more about value numbering, I recommend looking at the global value numbering in LLVM. And actually LLVM has multiple versions of value numbering. So uh, it, it might be interesting to see uh, how those versions differ and why a new version was introduced. And in fact, at MSVC, Microsoft C++ compiler also implements value numbering. And there are some great blog posts from some of my colleagues that uh, give you an overview of what is happening in the optimizer in case of uh, in case of MSVC. So let's recap value numbering. So value numbering is important because redundancy is everywhere. Even if you don't write redundant code, your compiler, at least some passes in your compiler will generate a lot of redundant code that needs to be taken care of. And the reason why it works this way, because we want to keep our stuff separate. Uh, this is this, so in some sense, compilers are solid. Um, and value numbering is a very effective method to optimize large portions of the code away when you have information that is known at compile time. But it can be also very effective when you don't know everything at compile time because it can do sub-expression elimination and many more. And algebraic identities are very important. As you can see, both when we use the chains of recurrences or value numbering, this was a recurring topic. We use these identities to guide our optimizations, to look for opportunities, and we could use these, uh, these uh, identities as recipes, and these recipes helps, can help us to implement compiler optimizations. So this is the power of algebra that I want you to appreciate after this talk. And you don't have to be a rock star to get started experimenting with compilers. There are many great tools that can help you get started really quickly. You can write your first pass in the matter of like minutes and you can implement powerful optimization algorithms in an afternoon. So let's conclude the talk. The compilers are full of marvels that I think are worth exploring. And it's not black magic. This is something that it is easy to understood if you, if you dedicate some time to it. Because if you look back at this talk, we didn't use any advanced math. We only used multiplications, additions, and recursive functions, simple recursive functions. So using this simple concept can get you very, very far because most of the compilers, sorry, most of the programs that we are writing are also not that complicated. At least some parts of those programs are not that complicated. And those aspects that are not that complicated can be optimized very powerfully and very efficiently using these simple methods. And, and uh, you don't need to have the compiler in some cases. So of course, there are some scenarios where you can write your code in a slightly smarter way that can help the compiler to do its job. But for some of the algorithms I showed you, those are very robust, at least as long as no complicated uh, pointer arithmetic and, and many indirections are not involved. So there are certain parts of the compiler that, is, that are very robust and you don't need to try to help it. You can try to write code the clearest way possible 
and trust the compiler to do its job because it is really great at it and it can it can it can do many many more this what i described today just a very small portion uh, so the compilers compilers are one of the one of the most ancient part of computer science uh, so the first compilers appeared very early in in the in the beginning of computing in some sense of, of course mathematicians were doing um, computation very earlier but compilers are co constructing compilers are one of the one of the most ancient topic of of uh, computer science so we got pre pretty good at it over time and this is something that can be relied on so thank you for listening and i will try to answer some of the questions okay so does the value numbering algorithm need to know about scope entry scope exit so that envi environment handling works properly so there are some details i punted on for example these algorithms i was talking about um, well value numbering in particular it works on virtual reg registers so in case of virtual registers they are registers that are that are um, available. They, there are infinitely many of them, and uh, they don't really have lifetime in the same sense as uh, local variables do. So, because this algorithm, these algorithms are running on those virtual registers, we don't need to think about scope entry and scope exit. But if you want to extend the value numbering algorithm, and want to have a global value numbering algorithm or a super local value numbering algorithm that is uh, optimizing more than a simple than a single basic block at a time. In that case, you do need to do something similar because the potential values of a virtual register can depend on the basic block you are in. And in that case, you are not really dealing with scope exit, scope entry, but you are dealing with basic block entry and basic block exit because those have uh, meanings. But uh, the way you handle basic block entries and basic block exit turns out to be in some sense very similar to how scope exit and scope entry would be handled in, in C++. So there are some kind of correspondence between the two, but not quite the same. Okay, the next question is how the compiler decides which passes to run and in which order? This is a really great question. And uh, unfortunately, it doesn't, uh, I doesn't have a great, I don't have a great answer. And the reason is that because uh, the way these uh, passes uh, or these pipelines evolved over time is was initially driven by intuition. And after that, it was driven by benchmarks. So someone tried to reorder the passes, passes a bit and, and demonstrated that this is beneficial by running some, um, some benchmarks. And after that, people tried to do some, ex some searches, like exhaustive searches and so on. For example, trying many different orders on many benchmarks and see which one is the best. But of course, because there are so many ways to order passes, because it's, it's, uh, it's exponential, it, it, it's the order of growth is, is, is n factorial. This, this is a very big search space, so it's, it's relatively hard to, to do it exhaustively. So, and, and also you cannot combine passes in arbitrary ways in most compilers because uh, some passes have prerequisites and, and so on. And this can also kind of help to reduce the search space a bit. And uh, with the... With, uh, latest buzzwords like machine learning. Of course, there are some people who are trying to use machine learning to guide these searches in the in this enormous space of possible pipelines. And actually those results are also very impressive. So it is possible to, for example, train a compiler to be to, to be better at certain domains. So if you compile a certain kind of programs, you can use some machine learning algorithms to to train to to train it to find the best pipeline for that domain uh, that can be used to to optimize those programs. And the last question: 
is there a consideration for compile times when implementing optimization passes? Have there been significant optimizations that were discarded because they took too long? Yes, and in fact, it is a, it is a constant argument going on in the scientific computing community and the compiler developer community, because if you are doing scientific computation, for example, weather simulation or something like that, your simulation might run for weeks or even for months. So basically, if you can have like a couple of hours or even a couple of days to optimize your program, then you would be able to get so much more out of it because you are running that program for so long time. But on the other hand, if you are a developer working on an application, you don't want to wait that long between compile times. So in one hand, there are many optimization flags that can uh, help you balance the compile time and optimization time. And, uh, and when the new optimization is added to the compiler, one of the key questions to ask is how long does these optimizations run? And depending on your budget for time budget for optimization, you might want or might not want to have that uh, pass in your pipeline. And uh, compiler developers are usually afraid of adding optimizations that would take too long to run. Usually when something is, is a, has a quadratic runtime in the number of, in the size of the source code, that's a no-go. So that's usually too expensive for most of the compilers. So this, this is something that, that uh, we usually consider. Okay, what's the name of the recursive function algebra to read more about it? It is called chains of recurrences. I believe uh, this term should be part of the should be part of the um, abstract for this talk. So uh, if if you're afraid to forget it, feel free to refer back to the abstract, and you will you will find this term so you can you can read up on it later. How about SIMD-based optimizations, especially ones targeted at loop vectoriza vectorization rather at basic blocks? Do you have any tips on how to help LLVM there? Well, so SIMD-based optimizations uh, is not something that I considered in this talk, but in general, one of the reasons why is it hard to do SIMD optimizations because you need to think about aliasing. So if you want to help LLVM doing SIMD better, one way to do that is to communicate the aliasing of your code. This can be done with uh, restrict pointers or some OpenMP uh, annotations. And, and there, there are some couple other options. And uh, according to my experience so far, this is the most effective way to help LLVM to to think about aliasing, what two pointers cannot point to the same array and so on. Will machine learning rewrite comp compilation algo rules similar to earlier question? Oh yeah, so um, I think uh, one of the, so I, I haven't seen much application in the real world yet to have machine learning uh, on the fly to rewrite source code, but there is uh, something called super optimization where you try to use certain smart tricks to find uh, equivalent but faster way of a code snippet. And often they are using it offline to derive new optimizations that, are, that later on are hand implemented in the compiler. And also one of the, one of the hardest questions uh, when it comes to trans compiler transformations, whether the transformation is beneficial or not. Sometimes there are a lot of uh, variables that you need to consider. For example, is this um, is this memory address uh, is is the when when I load something from this memory address is this in the cache or not? This is something you cannot know in advance, and there are many other considerations, uh, like in what context do I use these instructions? So. There are, I, I believe there are some, um, some approaches to use machine learning to try to derive cost models. So machine learning can be very efficient to help uh, determine whether a transformation is uh, 
beneficial or not? Is it an optimization or a pessimization? Okay, it looks like we are out of questions. And I see that in the chat, some people posted some very useful research papers to read on, read up on some of the topics um, that we that I discussed. So thank you all for for uh, being here, and and I really enjoyed the questions. And uh, I will try to be uh, around in gathered for a couple of hours in case some of you have more questions that you didn't have the chance to ask. Well, see you all, and thanks for being here. <laughs>